I'm Campbell Bickerstaff, <laughs> one of the curators of information technology at the Badhouse Museum. And this is a Canon Canola 1614P, which is a programmable desktop calculator from the mid to late 70s. It was donated uh, last year and we've just had an inquiry from somebody who wants to come in and turn it on to see how it operates because they're writing an emulator for it, which is a desktop version of what this hardware machine does. Now, uh, the, turning on vintage electronics is not something that we normally do at the Powerhouse Museum. That's something that we never do, actually. And, uh, but uh, we thought this endeavour to create an emulator was uh, a worthy cause, and uh, uh, my boss agreed, and then I asked the head of conservation, and he said it was okay. So we've got some people from our electronics department who are going to bring it up to speed on a large variac, which will introduce current to the device gradually, and we'll make sure it doesn't blow up. The display. Display warming up. Left hand side. There you go, look at that. Bit of, bit of action. Yep. And your LEDs are coming up now. They're, uh, they're uh, yeah. Nixie tubes. Well, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, 150, 170. Look at that. If we hit clear, once we're up to 230. Yeah, 230. Uh, we'll see what happens. Characters, I hit clear. Nought, clear, 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 clear. There's so many clear buttons. No, 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 no. Well, it's not looking very good, is it? Oh, yeah. Look, that looks. Because it's a programmable desktop calculator, and I haven't read the manual, I'm not sure if it's functioning as it should or it shouldn't. But it certainly is. Um, as we can see, there's no smoke or sound coming from the device, so, so uh, I think it's all good. Uh, welcome to the Powerhouse Museum. We're in the transit room at the Powerhouse Museum with our guest Peter Miller. Hello. Peter asked to uh, come in and have a look and activate, <laughs> if it was still working, a Canon Canola 1614P uh, programmable Mm, desktop mini computer really you you won't see a plus or a minus or a divide or multiply sign on here so that uh, it sort of put it out of my technical ability straight away uh, we as you saw we tested it yesterday brought it up to speed uh, current on a variac and nothing happened apart from it working which was good and we'll just flick it on again today uh, the printers connected uh, this is connected we're going to really hand over to Peter now because Peter wants to, he'll, he'll know more about it and uh, he'll be able to tell us a little bit more about this machine. Peter? Well, this is a machine that I used in high school about 35 years ago um, and I decided in a fit of nostalgia to write an emulator for the calculator so that I could reproduce what I'd experienced. This was probably the second machine I ever wrote software for. Um, I'd had access to other and this machines. And this is the software, isn't it? This is the sort of software. It comes on punched cards, um, which feed into the program card system. And the uh, punched cards are able to represent more than you can get to manually on the keyboard. Um, and you put them on these pre-perforated blue cards. These are what People who use this machine, these are what everyone remembers. Okay, so this is, the, this is a blank card. It's pre-perforated. You can just see the perforations. And when you, when you punch it out with a pencil or a compass, you get holes in it that you can see behind. And, it's, and it uses a photo sensor as it passes through. Very much like paper tape of the same era. Um, where it would punch. Yeah. Interesting that they chose not to use paper tape with this machine, even though those, those mechanisms were available at the time in that era. Um, and also, they provided seven bits, the same as this card does. Yeah. See, there are seven columns. Yeah. And so, but they didn't use yeah. ASCII. So this was really today. proprietary for this machine? There was it no it appears to have been, yeah. yes. And so they come out like... I saw one. They come out like this. Yeah. 
um, with the pre-perforations. So this is what people who use these, and mostly high school students, I understand that these were rolled out to a number of New South Wales high schools in the 70s. Yep, yeah, this one came from Heathcote High School. Mm, and, and that's my memory of about 1974, 1975, if memory serves, mm -hmm. when I was using this machine. Now, now, Peter's here today, one of the reasons Peter's here today is that he wants, well, he's, part of his request that enticed us to turn it on was that Peter was, is writing an emulator, and that's a, a software version of this piece of hardware. Uh, so, Peter's built uh, a replica of this control panel and this display, so there's a lovely Nixie display on the software as well. Yes. Uh, some of the, Peter apparently ran into some problems in that I think he, he couldn't recall or the manuals weren't explicit enough about how the certain operations are entered. And That's by correct. The only way of making that clear to Peter and everyone else in writing the emulator was to come in and actually physically get a hold of one and use it. Yes. So, so that, was, that was my objective today. Um, to use the calculator and the way electronics like this works is that they tend to have internally an internal state. Uh, you can imagine if you're entering a number, before and after the decimal point has a different meaning and the display operates differently depending on whether it's before or after the decimal point. And so the machine internally maintains a state of whether it's before or after a decimal point so that when you press a digit key it actually does something subtly different. Now that state machine it's called isn't documented in the manual. You can only infer the existence and infer the states that it can assume from the instructions. Now my challenge with the instructions is, and I hear I have a reproduction of the instruction manual uh, with some notes attached for questions I've got. Uh, my challenge is that in order to divine what this, instruction, this state machine does, I actually need to operate it. And strangely enough, some of the most informative things you can do to the state machine is get it into error states, because they tell you where it's not. And so we can, we can define the edges of this state machine by the error states. And this is what I wanted to do to confirm how it operates. Um, typically what happens in a calculator of this era is that you've got one displayed register. Um, in operate mode you would see a number. Uh, 1614 as a number. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> and now it depends. If we press the decimal point we can add fractions. But what happens to a variety of things? We can say square root. This is 40. That's pretty good. Ah, you see the internal state is driven by some of these selector buttons. That's been told to use no, no decimal places. If yep. we say floating point, overflow to square root, no, floating point. Isn't that interesting? I wonder what that is. Let's give it some more. Yes, all right, all right, all right. All right. To square root, there we go. Okay, it doesn't like floating point on square root. No, we have an error state that's informative. If we choose the floating decimal selection and, and tell it to square root, oh, that, that time it's it worked. Now. You see, it was just a bit stiff. It's um, probably a bit probably stiff. A bit it's been stiff. in storage for 30 years. Yes. What well, can well, we well, expect? Yeah, <laughs> I, I wonder when Heathcote High School might have been using it up until probably from the mid to late 70s, we understand probably through to the early 80s before they got something. Yes, got and then eventually the PC era happened and yeah. these sorts of things became dinosaurs that nobody mm. wanted anymore. Yeah. And luckily they kept it uh, in a, stored in a cool, dry environment and it's kept yes. to us in a fairly good condition. Oh, in operating condition, yeah. it's absolutely marvellous. Mm. So here we go, we've got, we've got some information already. Yeah. Now, we've got a bunch of other things that this is capable of. We can have negative numbers and this is the change sign key. And here's your negative indicator. Mm -hmm. Now on modern machines, of course, we're accustomed to having the negative indicator at the front. But the era that these machines were built in, they were still doing accounting by hand. And accountants still, to this day, put the negative sign at the other end. 
And so this sort of drove calculators because one of the markets for calculators at the time, particularly ones with a printer, yeah. was that accountants would do their sums yeah. and it would print up and then they would take that and they would put it into their records as yeah. a calculated tally. So that was one of their markets. And so we have this minus sign sitting here. Yeah. But now the, the question becomes, um, I can press a minus sign again, we get positive, that's fine. But we've got another piece of the state machine. Say I'm entering, you know, minus 4.5, okay? 4.5 negative. Yeah. What happens if I press another number? Does it, add, do, does it add the net other number to the end? Or does it start a new number? Okay. And if it starts a new number, where? As I was saying before, there's two, yeah. there's two registers. There's yep. one register that's displayed and there's one behind it. To do an addition or a multiplication or a division, you have to have two numbers. Yep. And so you've got the number behind yes. and the number in front. And so um, there has to be places in the state machine yep. Where it transfers. So we don't know if this has gone number. into a register yet. Well, we know it's in the front register. What we don't know is what in the back register. Yep. But if we press another number, ah, now we've got some information. Okay. Yep. The change sign doesn't alter the state machine that decides where it's up to yep. in entering a number. Good. Okay. Good. So we can turn this on and off, and we still get. Yep our number being entered, as opposed to the change sign being the very last thing you do. So now we have another question, all right? If we've got a blank slate and we say change sign, nothing happens. That's fair enough. Four. Aha. We can't say minus four in that order. Yep. The state machine says I negated zero, but it was zero. So you need all this information for your emulator? If I'm going to emulate it accurately, yes. we've got to bump into where the mistakes are. Yep. And know when this oh, oh, overflow land. Because you want land. people to be able to operate it in, in exactly the same fashion as it is. Yes. Physical, physical yes. Object is I, I, there is no challenge yeah. to em emulating the arithmetic. A modern PC yes. can do arithmetic to far greater accuracy yep. than this machine. That's not the point. The point is to reproduce the experience. Right. All right. And I, like I and I think this I think this is a reasonable interest for the museum. Because yes, it it's then possible to display this behind oh, glass. No, I'm, I'm not just interested, I'm excited. <laughs> you can display this behind glass, switched off, and in front of it you can put a modern computer yes. running the emulator, yes. and people can get a feel of mm. what it was like in 1972. The manual's dated 1972. Okay? Mm. So this is the sort of thing I'm after. I want to reproduce what's going wrong yes. so that I can be faithful to the operations. So we've, we've got our number four and we discovered that you can't say minus four and get a minus four. You actually have to enter at least one digit mm -hmm. before you change the sign. Yep. Terrific. Yep. The manual says if you do a square root at this point, mm -hmm. it will ignore the sign. Okay. Let's see what happens. Yep. It ignored the sign. Yeah. Now, on a modern computer, it will go, you're off your rocker. Yeah. You can't do the square root of a negative number. Yeah. Um, but, you see, this electronics wasn't very complicated. It wasn't very complex. Um, we're talking about the era of um, large-scale integration chips. That's the beginning of computer chips. You know, 16-pin chips were common. They had a few logic gates. They didn't do anything complicated. And because only a few logic gates took up so much real estate on a circuit board that has to fit inside this box. And they're expensive. And they're very expensive. Um, your state machine was as dumb as possible. That is, it had the fewest number of states so that you got the correct answer if you operated it correctly and you got an undefined random answer if you operated it incorrectly. Um, I understand from my research that they in fact used Texas Instrument chips and that were we to disassemble it and find the necessary chip we could look up the data sheet of the original Texas Instrument calculator chip. Maybe we'll do that next. So later after we've confirmed all the things that I want to do because I would hate to damage it beyond recovery. Yes. So 
we can assume that the state machine is as dumb as possible. And this, this change sign, not altering the state of the input, is one of those dumb as possible things. Um, it doesn't alter the, the outcome. And the square root of a negative number, ignoring the sign bit, that's another one of those dumb as possible things. Um, yes, it was, it, it's silly in modern terms, but in practical terms for the era, it was a reasonable design decision by the guys who were designing the electronics to go on those circuit boards. Um, the, the, the fascinating thing is that it did the square root relatively quickly, I don't know, a fraction of a second, um, and it probably did it within the calculator chip that was manufactured by Texas Instruments. Pretty quickly. I've got no idea how fast. My memory of it doesn't tell me how quickly it operated. My guess would be at the AC line frequency, that is 50 or 60 instructions a second. Yes. Um, which is dreadfully slow by today's terms, but vastly faster than a person could type on the keyboard and therefore quicker and more efficient than the humans that were slowly being displaced by technology. Um, certainly um, one of the fellows that I used to know when I was a child my bank account was with the Commonwealth Bank all children's bank accounts were and the local postmaster also had the the Commonwealth Bank franchise as all the post offices did and of course he did arithmetic all day every day and his ability to go down a line of figures and then write the sum at the bottom was by today's standards astonishing but by those standards pretty ordinary um, the advantage of this uh, and calculators like this at the time were they gave a record of the things that you'd added up um, and if you transposed two digits that would show in the record. Um, by that I mean if we turn the manual calculation switch on now it's going to put every operation that we typed into the keyboard and it's going to print it. So we'll clear that off and we'll say 56 plus 78 and we see and print display. And so now we have our number. Oh, and two numbers and the it's very, very hard to see. It's quite faint. The ribbons probably dried out in 30 years. But we see here 56 plus equals, which is this key. 76 plus equals, which is this key. And then I said print display, yeah. and it's printed me the total. And this is the sort of record that even today, I don't know about your accountant, but even today my accountant, when preparing my taxes, uses a printing calculator takes it out, sticky tapes it onto the record.